So in the second part of the tutorial, we will now look at how we can actually gen generate images or learn energy-based models for generative modeling. Specifically here, we will use the MNIST dataset, so the dataset here below. Uh, you probably have already seen it a lot of times, so it's just a, um, a dataset with a single channel, 28 times 28 pixels, and this represents handwritten digits. Usually this dataset is used for classifying um, for using simple algorithms to classify images, while here we will actually learn to generate new digits. So this is also something you will see in assignment 3, that you actually will start to generate your own images, especially on MNIST. The model we will use in our, um, in our energy-based model is a very simple one. So we just use a simple CNN model. As I said, you can use any possible model if you want. Um, here we just decided to go with a very simple one. So you see that we just apply a couple of um, convolutions. Here all with try 2 because our um, image is usually a lot of black pixels, therefore we can actually reduce it very fast in resolution. Uh, and we use the switch activation function that we have seen before. Um, and just has have a single output dimension which then predicts our energy score. So there you see it's basically nothing surprising, just using a simple CNN model with a single scalar output for our image. However, now we will come to a few training tricks. So as I said, um, the theory of energy-based models is nice. However, to actually train very deep models, you need a few tricks. Otherwise, your model is likely to diverge or has other difficulties to actually train properly. One of them is uh, when we look at our sampling mechanism. So if I go up here again, um, you know that for training a model with contrastive divergence, we need to sample from our model during training. Right? So every time we would actually have to sample models, then we take a greater step, and then we would have to sample again because our model has changed. Right? And there you see that for the sampling, we need this Monte Carlo chain, and you usually need something like 200 or 250 iterations to really converge to good images. And that just uh, slows down training quite a lot, um, as you might expect. And therefore, our idea is to use the buffer. So what do we mean here? We, for example, let's take the very first step. So in the very first step, we have in initialized our model. We'll then sample for example, 128 images from scratch. We take noise, push it through our model, do the MCMC uh, to sample a few images and then push them through the network. However, we don't want to throw away the samples afterwards, but rather we place them into a buffer. And then in the next step, we will actually look at images we had in the buffer and use them as starting point for our MCMC algorithm. So instead of just reusing them, we actually use them a starting point and apply again 60 iterations or how many iterations we want to have. Um, and this way we still allow our model or our samples to adjust to the current model while we are still much more efficient um, because we don't have to run now for 200, 250 steps. But it's shown if you already start from a reasonable point, which would be then the samples from the previous model, we can use just a few steps to actually converge quicker to one of the images that might be reasonable from our model. And this is what the sampling buffer has as idea, uh, that we reuse then samples from our previous iterations as a starting point. The code is shown below. I will not go into too much detail. Uh, however, we can look at the most important parts. So my, uh, my buffer is basically just a very big tensor. Uh, I initialize it first with random values uh, between minus one and one, because I scaled the images accordingly between minus one and one. Um, we then just basically at each step, what we do is 5% of, of the samples will start from completely scratch, and 95% uh, of, uh, of the samples will start from our buffer, which is so we still allow some completely new samples to get into the buffer, but usually uh, the ones in the buffer is already a good starting point. So this basically we make sure that we still explore, but um, still use the computational resources efficiently. 
the function generates samples. This is really where we now sample from our model. So we have given here the images. You see I set it to require gradients too, because now we want the gradients for the input image. And then at each step we first add some noise. And then we push the images through the model backward, do some gradient clipping to prevent any uh, extreme values in the output. And then we just change our input images accordingly to the gradient. Gtash, take a zero, uh, make them zero again for the next step, and just continue. So this is basically what we do then for, for example, 60 steps. We always add some noise and then optimize the image again towards the direction of uh, our highest likelihood. So this is the whole idea of using a sampling buffer. The next part here is how do we now finally train a model? So I uh, summarized it here in an algorithm to uh, really show you what are the uh, steps we need to take uh, in our algorithm. So first we of course initialize our buffer empty and then we have here our training loop. So we first sample data from the true data set. We then sample uh, data from our model as we have explained before. So 95% from the buffer starting otherwise from a random uh, distribution do our MCMC sampling, stop the gradients because we don't want gradients then to flow through the, all the samples. Uh, that would be also way too big computation graph to calculate actually. We calculate the contrast of diversion loss and then we actually also calculate the virtualization loss. So what do I mean here with virtualization? So as you know the output of a model is uh, can basically chosen any scale. Right? It can be between minus infinity and infinity and therefore the model can also scale output as much as it wants. And actually if you add a bias towards the output you see that it doesn't change anything in comparing two images right? because the bias would be eliminated anyways in this contrastive divergence. Um, however we can see that the models can sometimes have problems to actually come to a value so you see that the output value then fluctuates between suddenly 50 and the next step it goes down to minus 50 and then you just have this oscillating curve of what is the output, the standard uh, output of the energy model and therefore we take a little, like a very small virtualization loss to push the outputs close to zero. This way we can make sure that the model's outputs not oscillate too much uh, for the two samples and for the samples of a model that are high likelihood. We then just perform SGD and add our uh, samples from that step to the buffer so we can use them in the next step again. So below here I then implemented it as a lightning module. Uh, in the training step here you see now take the real images. Uh, I add a little bit of noise because the models can sometimes have problems if um, if you compare basically very clean images and a little bit noisy images um, then they for example just focus if the dark part is perfectly clean or has some noise in it as real images are usually clean in that sense for MNIST uh, this just makes sure that the model cannot overfit on this part. Then we sample a few fake images, push them through the model, calculate the regularization loss weighted here by a hyperparameter alpha which is or case 0.1, take the contrast of divergence loss, sum them, and that's it. And that you see, as a validation step, what I do is I take then our test set, uh, push it through the model, and compare it to uh, completely noise data. So completely noise data is then of course far away from the samples we use on the training step. However, this would show us how good the model can now distinguish between completely noise and two images two images that it actually hasn't seen before. Below here then I use callbacks. So PyTorch Lightning, as you know, uh, has the concept of callbacks and I use them here uh, more extensively to actually also show you or give you some template of code uh, to use callbacks also for generative models. So the callbacks here are always called after an epoch ends and this callback for example just generates when me no, uh, new images. So I just call the generate function in the sampler, so sampler that generates samples, generate them and plot them here 
we can see them later on the tensor board. Below here, the sampler callback basically uh, visualizes some samples of which are actually the sample buffer, uh, so we know what is actually going on in there. And the outlier callback uh, it adds to the logger one metric called rent out. So this is basically telling me what is the output for random images, which just helps me to know what is right now the training progress of the model. After now seeing uh, the code for the model, we can of course define again our training function. So here's nothing uh, surprising. We train the model. In this case, we have here a pre-trained model, so we just load it. Next part, I want to take this uh, trained model and actually look at a few things so that you get familiar with how now such a model actually reacts. First thing is that we can load the TensorBot. So I provided a TensorBot as well for the training um, which you can look at, so you know what training dynamic actually these models have. Um, I just remove here the ignored outlay outliers because we actually want to look at the outliers. So you see, for example, the loss first starts with a, a quite negative value because the model is, well, it's quite easy for the model to actually compare a noise with real images in the beginning, but we also in the beginning actually sample um, Basically, if you take a model, it is very sim uh, simple for us to get high values compared to the images um, as the model has been randomly initialized. Right? So some random noise always gets then higher values than real images. However, it converges very quickly to zero and stays also there because these contrastive diversions always adjust the samples um, for our input. Right? So therefore, our loss basically stays at zero, but we are learning just the loss is changing with, or the objective is always changing with our model. Uh, same you see when, for example, contrastive divergence, we also converge fast here. Um, what we can, for example, look at is rather the random out. So here you see the outputs for random images, and this really goes down um, quite nicely, and this shows you the training progress, because now you are able to distinguish between, um, between random images and actual real images. So I also plotted here images, however, we also plot images ourselves below um, so that you get some intuition behind it. So this is the next step we look at. What I do now is I take four random images, or I want to uh, generate four images, and we will actually look at the steps during the MCMC algorithm. So as we know, you always take a step to improve your generation this is basically how you can see as MCMC that you always improve your generation. Uh, and then we can just look at intermediate steps so we actually see how the model transform a noise image to our actual digits. Or how well actually also the digits look like, because we haven't seen any generations from the model so far. And there you see, so the first one is from what we start. This is pure noise, right? And then you see already after 32, Iterations for model already converge to some sort of digit, or at least something that looks like MNIST. And then over the next steps, uh, the digits just get clearer and clearer. Like the two here, you see that is a bit, uh, a bit weird as a two, could be also an eight, whatever. And then you see that it really optimizes the digit to a clear two. Same with a nine, it also becomes better and better over iterations. Another thing we can look at in these models is out of distribution detection. So of course here, these images, you can then play around for it yourself. You can generate more ones. So these ones are fairly good examples from the image, but of course, sometimes it also fails. Like this two is not really the nicest two. Um, so it is able to generate some images, but it's still not perfect. That we also see here in the out of distribution detection, so now, for example, we want to really check if a model can distinguish between real images or something we do to the images. So what I do first is I will check um, how well is the score if I take random images in, so really random. There you see the energy score is something like minus 17, minus 18. So it's really a big difference to the real images. But I can check here again, so we want it of the two images and where you see about, but it's basically zero in average um, because we have also learned 
that the virtualization pushes this towards zero, right? What we can do now is that we actually take a real image, do some transformation on it, and compare the scores. So that we can then check whether our uh, our node or network can actually distinguish between out of distribution ones and two ones. So what we first do is we take a test image and I just add a little noise to the image and let's see. So we have here the seven, I add a few noise and then you see that the score drops. So the score of this image was 0 0.03, the score of this one is minus 0 0.07. So you see the score drops but not significantly. Um, it is still considered for this energy model actually larger gap uh, if I increase here the noise can, for example, put it to 0 0.6, and you see that probably you have a score drops more and more um, because this is not a real image. So we see it still detects at least this Gaussian noise. However, what is if we do some different transformation I hadn't seen? For example, we take the 7 and flip it. Then it's not really a 7 anymore. Right? So then we would actually like to have a very low score. Also, you see so the score is decreasing, but not as much as we might have hoped. So we see that there is already some limitation to our model in terms of out of distribution detection. The same if I take now the 7 and actually make it much smaller. So most of the image is 0. Um, in this part especially, so this is not typical for MS and should be an out of distribution image. Um, here it's minus 0.02, so again it dropped, but not really significantly. So you can probably still find training images that also got the score. So this shows you that. It can detect some out of distribution things, but not everything. So if I really do some tricks to the image, then it might not be able to do it. Nevertheless, up here, it still shows that it can generate actual digits. So it's not just focusing on Gaussian noise, because otherwise you would not be able to see these generations. So this still shows, yes, we can generate, but there's more to improve on. A thing I just wanted to mention here is the instability of our models. So energy-based models can be instable in the sense that uh, if you don't have a perfect hyperparameters or have done a bigger hyperparameter search, they fail. So I've also experienced this here when I created the notebook that I really had to fine-tune the hyperparameters well. Otherwise, at some point, for example, you can see up here, so if we go to the loss function, some point suddenly it uh, dropped completely, meaning that uh, my output, so my samples, just became noise, and for the uh, model it became very simple to distinguish between its own samples and the real images. However, its energy loss surface, or basically its energy surface, had so many hills, so so many local optima, that the MCMC -MC algorithm was failing, so it wasn't able to get out of the noise. Um, hills anymore and actually to the real images and therefore basically the model failed. And this is something that happens more than you want, would want it um, and therefore energy-based models on big images or for example RGB data is still something where you really have to be careful with hyperparameters and eventually it, using a trick like if you detect your model is diverging, stop the training, go 100 steps uh, before in the past, take the model you have saved, hopefully before that, load it and try again with a different seed. And then hopefully your model will not diverge and you continue that till you finish training and then ensure that you don't diverge. Also that's not the best practice, so this is really your last hope to catch. This brings me then also to the conclusion. So we have seen now how we can generate images with an energy-based model. Um, by using a contest of divergence and how we sample, namely with MCMC. Um, we can detect some out of distribution data, but it's still not perfect. So we will also then see in the next lectures more generative models like VAE, GANs, and normalizing flows, and that are often more stable. So energy-based models, if you want to take it, it's usually good for out of distribution de uh, detection. It's actually the best one because it trains on detecting its own out of distribution. Right, but um, if you would just want to generate images, there are probably better approaches to do so. Um, however, it's still good to be aware of this method and to know what it is.